Yep, lure on. Let's do it. All right. What a wonderful day it's been to be here with everyone on the phone and all the wonderful presenters. So uh, I'm excited uh, to introduce Brooke. Brooke Warner, uh, my colleague and friend, is a publisher of She Writes Press and president of Warner Coaching Incorporated. She's the author of What's Your Book and How to Sell Your Memoir and co-author with me, Linda Joy Myers, of Breaking Ground on Your Memoir, which is coming out in a print edition and very soon. Brooke's expertise is in tra traditional and new publishing, and she sits on the board of the Independent Book Publishers Association, the Bay Area Book Festival, and the National Association of Memoir Writers with me. Her website was selected by the Write Life as one of the top 100 best websites for writers in 2014 and 15, and you can find Brooke online at facebook.com slash Warner Coaching and on Twitter at Brooke underscore Warner. And uh, so can't wait to hear what you have to say about how to sell the memoir. People are really geared up for this today. Yeah, and we have developed today to be a bit of an arc, and so there's a lot of ground that the other presenters today have already covered on on some of what I'm going to be talking about, and so hopefully I can build and take it from there. So here's a photo of me. Some of you already know what I look like, and <laughs> which I already said who I am. So I am the publisher of She Writes, mm -hmm. president of Warner Coaching. We teach this class together. Um, and so write your memoir in six months. And then also we have a, a live event coming up in Berkeley that we wanted to share with everyone. And I'm going to say just a word about that at the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm the author of these books, and I'm excited about my book that is coming out in the spring 16, which is called Green Light Your Book. And it's important that everybody know this about me, which is that I come from traditional publishing. Uh, 14 years, in fact, in traditional publishing, eight of those years at Steel Press. And then I left Steel Press three years ago to start She Writes Press, which is a hybrid publishing company. But the foundations of She Writes Press are exactly the same as, as Steel Press. I basically took that model and said, this works, um, but we're going to do a hybrid version of it, which means that the author invests. And so I feel I'm very immersed in traditional publishing. I have a lot of connections in traditional publishing, and I understand traditional publishing. And I'm an advocate of traditional publishing. I also am a harsh critic of traditional publishing. And I think it goes, to, you know, it, it's not uh, contradictory. It works for some people. And I fully understand that authors want to get traditionally published. Who doesn't want to have someone pay them to publish their book? It, it is absolutely a dream for most people that they've dreamed about since they were kids oftentimes. And that said, you know, and I appreciate Stephanie's uh, perspective and, and somewhat rosy outlook um, on something that, you know, is just becoming increasingly difficult and the barriers to traditional publishing are just higher than they've ever been. And so I say all of this not because I don't think people can still get traditionally published. I absolutely think you can. I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I'm an advocate for multiple points of entry, you know, going the agent route, going the small press route, but you can't do them simultaneously. Um, but I also am a big believer that if, it doesn't work out for you, it, is, it should not be the end, and that many, many, many people are being rejected, uh, not because their books are not good or beautifully written or outstanding, but because they do not have an author platform or a significant enough author platform, which was the entire um, you know, thing of, of Dan's presentation today. So that's a little context for where I'm going to lead into today and why. I am a firm believer that your proposal has to completely kick ass, <laughs> mm -hmm. and because if it doesn't, you're just you're not going to get your foot in the door. So um, on that note, and Linda Joy already said my social media handles, where I uh, am very active on social media, talking about publishing and writing and all kinds of other stuff. So let's recap today. Uh, you know, we talked about what agents and editors are looking for, Gordon and Stephanie. 
Gordon, the agent, Stephanie, the editor. Uh, and Gordon said, you know, not all agents think a proposal is necessary. Stephanie said most editors prefer it and said she certainly prefers it. When I had her job, if someone tried to pitch me a, uh, a manuscript without a proposal, I just said, you need to go back and work on your proposal. I'm not taking it. And again, this is for nonfiction. You know, fiction plays by different rules, which Stephanie said earlier. But I think it's fundamentally important that you have a proposal when you are shopping your work. Uh, I put nothing but your best foot forward. This is the whole thing of a proposal. It's sweat equity. It shows that you are willing to do the work. People are like, oh my gosh, a proposal is difficult. Well, yeah, so is being a published author. It takes a lot of work and so does building a platform. And so if you think that you're going to just get a publisher to sign you and then you get like kicked back in your lazy boy and you know, watch the rewards come in. That is not how this works. And you have to be from the very beginning, starting with your intention to publish, uh, really, really all in. And, and so the proposal is a piece of that. It's a piece of being all in. Platform matters more than you'd hope it would. So Dan was awesome this morning. I love listening to Dan talk about platform. I teach on platform too, and every time I listen to him, I get new ideas and new ways of thinking about things. I love that he's pure heart, and that's good. You know, it, it does matter, and heart is important, but so does bylines. Um, bylines are important, and building your list and, you know, having actual statistics. So you can still get published when you have a smaller platform. It does happen. Uh, you know, this is this. Stephanie said, you know, it's not a science, it's an art, and sometimes editors just fall in love with projects. But that said, you want to be working on your platform long before your book is even close to being ready to shop to an agent or an editor because they will look at what you have and they'll say, wow, really good job, but I'm sorry, you have no platform. You need to go back and work on it. <clears throat> so that's just the reality. This process is a long haul. Hang in there. You know, if your publishing goals are tradi too traditionally published and you're sitting there and you're like, I have no platform. I mean, there was the woman earlier who was 92 years old and said, do I have any hope to get traditionally published if I don't have a platform? I honestly don't, I, I don't feel so strongly that you do. You know, I think that you have to go back and work on it. And I understand to be 92 and to be like, wow, this feels very difficult. But sometimes you can use your age to your advantage. Um, you know, people are always admiring of people who are doing things later in life. And so doing some things, you know, and, and trying to build a bit of a platform, even at an older age, they always say it's never too late. So I, I think efforting toward that is a good thing. So we're going to get started on how to sell your memoir. And that is my book cover how to sell your memoir and you guys are all getting a copy of that with this uh, registration today so you'll all be emailing that a copy a, a, not, not a print copy but a email PDF so do proposals really matter again I just hear all of these people who go to writers conferences and they talk to a sampling of agents like Gordon you know and, and three of them say no we don't really need it and, you know, five of them say, yeah, it, it's fairly important. And five of them say, I think it's super important. So the problem with this industry is that a lot of people vary about how they think about things. But it is a little bit like going into a job with a portfolio. When I applied for the job at Steel Press, I brought in a portfolio of all of my acquisitions from my previous job. That was not required. It was extra. And one of the things that my boss told me after I got the job was that she was so impressed that I brought that in. It made me stand out above my competition. Similarly, proposals will make you stand out above your competition. And it is freaking competitive out there. And so you really need to do everything that you can. Your proposal represents, I said this already, sweat equity and partnership. It shows that the publishers are looking to engage with people who they feel are going to put a lot of hard energy into it. I always had a red flag when I was at Steel Press and people used to kind of hear the like, 
oh, I don't know. I mean, that sounds like a lot. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Well, if someone's suggesting that you do something and that is your attitude about something, that that's an automatic red flag that you're not going to be a partner in this, and, and editors can see that right away. How your proposal will help you, these are just my thoughts on this. Your book, thinking about your book as a product, if not a business. I realize that your memoir, my God, it's your baby, it's your sweat, tears, you know, it's all of these things. It's, it's tremendous to have written a memoir. But the book publishing industry is looking at it as a product. They want to be moved. Stephanie certainly spoke to that. But it's a product that they're trying to sell. And you need to be thinking about it in that way if you want to sell your book, even if you have this emotional connection to it, which you sure, surely do, and, you know, if you're not sick of it by now. Understanding your readership is how a proposal will help you. And finally, the value of a marketing plan. And I believe that all of these things are important no matter how you ultimately choose to publish. So if you were to end up to self-publish, for instance, having done the proposal is not a waste. It is incredibly valuable, and you will learn a lot about your book in the process and how to talk about your book, which is very important. Wrap your mind around the book proposal, okay? So Stephanie said earlier she didn't think that it needed to be more than 75 pages. So that's true. 75 pages is probably a good target, but some of you are going to include multiple sample chapters, and proposals are often over 100 pages with the sample chapters included. So don't be afraid of the length. It's all good. Uh, there are two components, editorial and marketing, six parts altogether, three editorial components, the overview, chapter summaries, and author bio, and three marketing components, marketing and publicity plan, competitive and comparative titles, and the target audience. Now, a whole bunch of you have been saying in the window that you want the slides, and I just want to acknowledge that. I realize that this is important, and I will figure out we can do slide deck or something. The, the slides are enormous, and that's the main reason that we're not going to email them out, but we will find a way to get you um, the information that you're looking for because we realize that there's a lot of stuff on here, and we're moving kind of fast. But at the end of the day, you have your six primary components that does not include the chapter summaries and it doesn't include what I call the front matter, you know, like the title page and the table of contents, but I will talk about that in, in my book. All right. So I'm going to go through each of these one by one and talk about why they're important and what you need to think about. The book that I'm going to be sending you guys is a lot of information about this stuff, but there's just some general information about the overview. Each section, actually, that I'm going to cover here is that I hope will land with you as you begin to work on your proposals. Keep your overview short. One to two pages is sufficient. People tend to be overly wordy. You need to learn how to encapsulate what your story is about in a page or two. And if you can't do that, then you really would need to get a little more disciplined, uh, especially because you need to figure out your pitch and your talking points, your elevator pitch. These things really actually matter. They're not just fun exercises. Uh, this is learning how to talk about your book in the world to other people without making them be like, oh, my God, i got to get out of here. Um, Lead with a hook or something universal, a statistic, a fact, or a question. These are things that are very helpful to selling memoirs. Stephanie's whole case study about Brain on Fire focused on the fact that that memoir basically was about the medical industry and the ways in which the, the health industry is failing people. I am sure, although I never saw her proposal, that the author's hook and some of her statistics were about that fact that, you know, the medical industry has problems and that that was one of the major leads. So be looking for things that you can add that lend um, some, some credibility and, and some statistics and helpful information to the uh, agent or the editor to help them sell it. Keep it in the first person. And again, this is my recommendation. I just think that you're writing a memoir, and right off the bat from the overview, we should get to know who you are and we should hear your voice. 
is there a takeaway evident for the reader? Linda Joy spoke about takeaway. We both teach about takeaway. I am obsessed with takeaway. I think it is hugely important because um, I used to buy memoirs and I went to marketing meetings where the marketing team would say, okay, well, what's the takeaway for the reader? And I would need to come up with that right off the bat. And if it wasn't evident, then it was a no-go. You know, there has to be a strong reason why uh, people are picking up this book and they need to be able to see and feel what's in it for them. And so if your book is just about, like, this happened to me and then I did this and I did that, and you're never thinking about its impact on the reader or reflecting back to the reader, it's not ready to sell. And that needs to be in the proposal. Chapter summaries. So Susan had asked a very good question in the last uh, in the session with Stephanie about whether chapter summaries are necessary. <laughs> and I had written yes! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Why? Ding ding ding! This is what makes readers keep going. And when I'm talking about readers, I'm talking about agents and editors. When I got a proposal at Field Press, what I did is I read the overview, and if it was compelling, the next thing I looked at was the author bio. And if the author bio had some amount of capacity to convince me why that person was the right person to write this book, then I read the chapter summaries. And if the chapter summaries did not tell me what the book was about or did not do a good enough job of showcasing the arc of the story in a way that made sense or if I could poke too many holes in it that left me being like, oh, my gosh, I'm not following, I did not read the sample chapters, end of story. And I know a lot of agents and editors who are the same, you know, who feel the same way. So I really feel that this is the most important part of the editorial uh, book proposal. Your objective is to convey why your book is relevant, you know, and, and there are other objectives too, of course, to show the narrative arc to keep your reader interested. But at the end of the day, the summary is it's like the cliff, the cliff notes for your book. And so if you think about why cliff notes exist, they exist for cheating. <laughs> and, you know, I, it's a funny way to look at it, but author or agents and editors have to cheat a little bit because they simply have too much volume. There's just way, way, way too much volume. And so we need those cliff notes to be able to, um, you know, just keep up with the sheer volume of what we're getting and to be able to, um, you know, look at that and decide which books to weed out and which books to actually spend more time with. Mail your takeaways. Okay. Well, I already said that. Like I said, I'm obsessed, so I can't keep it out. But you really want to make sure that every single summary talks about a takeaway and answers the question, what is in this chapter for the reader? What is the universalism? What is the thing that the author is going to be left with? Not just what happened to you. That's not enough for memoir. No single summary should be longer than a page. I mean, I would always like to see a summary be less than a half a page. But if you need it to be longer, do not let it go over a page. You want to try to keep this thing manageable. Okay, moving right along. Author bio. Modesty has no place here. I can't say this enough. I often say to people, you need to create an I am fabulous list. This is in my book. So really sit down and be unabashed. Be ridiculous. Be over the moon about yourself and see what happens. And I can't even tell you the number of times I've coached people through proposals and they'll send me this wimpy little author bio and I'm like, hmm, well, have you ever been on a radio show? Have you ever published a guest blog post? Have you ever earned an award? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course I've done that. Or, oh, I forgot about this thing that I did. It happens all the time because people tend not to want to toot their own horn. We're taught that that is bragging. The author bio is about bragging. You really need to show all the ways in which you're totally wonderful and awesome and why you make so much sense as a partner, again, someone that the publisher wants to take a risk on. And we're looking for people to be really awesome. You know, it is not about being like, oh, I'm just going to not mention that I was on national television. No, absolutely, you need to put everything in there and go for it. Let your personality shine, but keep it professional. By this, I mean that, like, yes, your personality 
can be on the page and you can say things, you know, like you live with, you know, Tammy's bio says she lives with her kids and her two dogs and her horse. That gives you a little bit of information about her. But then what I mean by keeping it professional is not to get um, kind of, I, I don't, I'm going to use the word obnoxious, but I don't want that to be, you know, taken in the wrong way. People can be a little over the top. And I've just seen a lot of bios. They're too cute. You know, it's like she still sees her, you know, best friend every year on the same day to do this, that, and the other. It's like that's sweet and it's great for you and your best friend, but it's completely irrelevant to the book. You know, so that said, where it's in, I, this is one of my points, personal details relevant to your book are for a fair game. You know, like if your book is about becoming a grandparent, for instance, it's completely relevant to talk about your grandchildren. So just think it, you might want to get an outside perspective on it. Um, I think that sometimes people are a little gushy, and sometimes gushiness is not professional. So just keep that in mind. Don't include your CV. Um, it's just we don't really need a bullet-pointed list. You know, you can put that stuff in your marketing section, and it's the author biography is meant to be narrative. Okay, so we're just marching right along here. Marketing and publicity, why is that monster there? Because this is a beast, an absolute beast. Um, the marketing and publicity section is the, you know, which is one component of the larger marketing section is a lot of work. It takes a lot of research. Uh, you've got to figure out who your readership is, and then you have to answer the question, where do they hang out? And that is what the marketing and publicity piece is about. It's finding those readers, talking about how you're going to reach them. It is identifying blogs and magazines, saying that you're going to guest post um, on places that are actually realistic, you know, like that you could get a Huffington Post blog, but you don't want to say that you're going to be on the Today Show, you know, unless you actually have Today Show confirmation. So it is a lot of dreaming into what can happen. Make it robust, by which I mean make it a lot of pages. This section should be, you know, maybe six, seven pages on the short end. It could be as many as 15 pages. It should really showcase all of the things that you can and will do, not only the things that you are doing. Do your research, that's sort of self-evident. Smoke and mirrors, I think that this one is important because what I mean by this is the can and will. I can and will travel to 20 different cities to promote my book. I can and will hire a publicist to supplement the efforts of the in-house publicist. Am I actually doing those things now? No. So you can create a very strong marketing and publicity section talking about the things that you will do, and that's why I say it's a bit of smoke and mirrors. It's not lying. It's just saying things that are not actually happening yet. Save who you think your readership is for the target audience. Again, this is not the place to say who your readers are. That's in the next section. And a lot of times people put their readers in the marketing and publicity section, so I just want to make the strong point that this is not where that belongs, that that, in fact, belongs here and the target audience. So the target audience, um, you know, where the marketing section is, you know, detailing, you know, places, like I said, you answer the question, where do people hang out? So I'm going to kind of talk about these two in tandem for just a second. With the target audience, I said bullet them, by which I mean, don't say women. It's such a bad, you know, general uh, bullet point because women are half the population. But you could say, you know, like Tamara was sharing all these uh, books about autism. You can say, you know, parents of children with autism, for instance. That is absolutely a great target audience. You can drill down into really figuring out who your readership is. Specificity is a good thing. So you might say that runners are your target audience if you're writing a book that a memoir that has to do with running like a book that i acquired at field press called uh, second wind by cami osman which was a book about running seven marathons on seven different continents and so in her case the target audience absolutely was runners and that was perfect and runners are a great audience because 
they're they're a big audience, but they're quantifiable, and they also are hobbyists. And so there's a whole bunch of running stuff out there and running magazines, and they're kind of like the perfect example of an audience that's actually reachable. So you want to be thinking about this when you're thinking about your target audience is, is it a quantifiable group? How can I reach them? So mothers are good, but again, there's a lot of different kinds of mothers. So you could say mothers of teens you know, or mothers of toddlers. It's good to get specific and to drill down into what kind of mom am I talking about? Because again, they're, you know, mothers in general might be too big a category, kind of like women. So we would often see at Steel Press, you know, things like feminists. And again, that's a good um, subgroup of women because self-identified feminists are actually not that difficult to reach. They read feminist websites and they subscribe to Ms. Magazine. You know, so these are these are good ways to think about your your target audience. Picture your reader and then identify them. Really think about who you think is going to be reading your book and try to give them characteristics and this will help you figure out who your target audience is. And then again, don't resist going niche. It is really an okay thing to say, um, you know, People who, I mean, this is a boring one <laughs> to spring to mind, but people who sit on boards, you know, or um, people who are into scuba diving. When I was at the Publisher University that I mentioned um, in April, the publisher of, uh, uh, what is it called? It's not REI, um, Patagonia. Patagonia has their own press. And she was talking about this book that was about rock climbing. It was about extreme rock climbing. And the audience was very, very niche. But this book has sold like 10,000 copies, which is totally amazing because it's a super identifiable audience. And again, they're an easy to reach audience and they're really passionate about climbing. And they buy books and then they sell them in Patagonia. So there's that too. Uh, but anyways, as you're identifying all of these different people, then you are thinking about them and segueing it into your marketing. Like, okay, so if I know that I'm going for rock climbers or mothers with autistic children or whatever the case might be, then question number two, where do I find these people? And that is what the question that you are trying to answer in the marketing section. Comparative titles. Someone had asked earlier, what does that mean? Stephanie was talking about it. Uh, comp titles, comparative or competitive. Everyone has comp titles. There is no such thing as a book that does not have a comp title, and that is the worst thing that people say. And I used to get proposals that would say, there are no comp titles. There is no book like this ever written. Well, the problem with that is that it's not understanding the purpose of the comp title. The purpose of the comp title is actually to sell books. It's not to distinguish yourself as the most unique memoir that was ever written. It is a way to show your agent and your editor that there is a readership for this book. So when you say there are no comps, the effective message is, I don't think that, I don't know how to sell this, basically. So the comp titles have a singular purpose, and it is to show that other books exist in your genre and in your category, and they have actually sold well, and that that justifies the fact that your book also will sell. So that's a super important way to think about this. There are two ways to comp by style or by theme. So when I say style, I mean writing style. You could say that your work is very much like Joan Didion, you know, that people have often said that you write like Lucy Greeley. Um, I think thematic is more, more effective, but style is not inappropriate. And thematic is, you know, you are, to use the running example again, you know, you've written a book about running, and so second win. Cammy's book is your comp title because she also wrote a book about running. Stephanie said, don't use wild, don't use eat, pray, love. The reason is because those are national bestsellers and they've sold hundreds of thousands of books and therefore they're not good comp titles. The reason is because they, everyone tries to use them and they're not actually helpful. They become too big of bestsellers and the numbers are too astronomical and the point of the comp title is actually to help agents and editors establish a realistic sales base for your memoir. 
It, so if you say, oh, okay, well, wild is my comp, what that's saying is that you think that your book can sell, you know, 200 million copies, but the problem is that you don't have Oprah picking you for her book club yet. So it's not a good comp. And that's why um, we don't like to use bestsellers. Break your comp down by topic. So this is just because you could have, um, you know, a, a for instance, let's say your memoir is a travel and a food memoir, which is actually kind of a common combination. So what you can do is break your comp titles then down by theme. And you could list travel memoirs that are similar to your book and then bullet point the, all the different ones. And then a different subhead, which would be the food memoirs. And then you would bullet point all of those ones. So you can have multiple sections here if you need to. Compare and contrast is not a slam fest. What I mean by this is that you have to compare and contrast. You have to say, my book is similar to this book thematically. I also wrote a food memoir, but it's different because, and then you go on to say why it's different, but I used to, I read so many um, proposals that would be like, it's different because this author, you know, is a really bad writer <laughs> or something. You know, it, it, it's not meant to be negative. You're trying to find a book that is actually a good competitor. Um, and, and you want to think about that in the healthiest form of competition. Uh, not that, oh, my gosh, this book exists and so it is, you know, and people aren't going to buy my book. That's not how books work. People who like memoir buy multiple memoirs. So, you know, I am reading, for instance, um, H is for Hawk, right? But I would probably read another book that was on a similar theme, which is like grieving or loss, and I have, right? So it's not that there's only one book out there for, um, you know, that that can do that job basically. Okay, so moving into tying it all together, these are just the components that I didn't include in the step-by-step -step, but which are included in my book. The title page, the proposal table of contents, the sample chapters, and the query letter, and I'm not going to talk about these because I write about them and you're all going to see what those are, but th this is how you tie it all together and you need all of these things in your proposal, including the query letter, which Gordon touched upon a little bit in the first session. It's obviously important because you send the query letter as an ask. You send the query letter to say, may I send you my proposal? And so if your query letter is not doing a good enough job, then you never get a response or people say no thank you. So you can pretty quickly find out how effective your query letter is by the response rate that you're getting. And you know that's a topic for a whole separate webinar, but it's an important piece. Did that feel like a lot? I'm sure. <laughs> I imagine that it did. I said, don't worry, you'll be getting your copy of How to Sell Your Memoir Tomorrow. We are uploading these videos for you guys and figuring out how to do the slide deck so you can take all of this one bit at a time. And really, you want to do that. I mean, just like the process of writing your memoir is a lot, um, the proposal is a lot. You know, it, it's a big, big deal. And it should not be something that you try to rush through. It's something that is probably going to take you a few months, even if you're moving at a fast clip and you want to craft it in the way that you crafted your memoir. You have one shot. This is the document that is going to sell your memoir. So I said this, take one step at a time. Don't try to sit down one Saturday afternoon and say, oh, I'm going to do all of the editorial components today. It's too much pressure and it is going to be noted in a hastily put together proposal. Proposals are for agents and editors and you. I said this at the beginning of the presentation, but the proposal process will help you refine what you're doing. It will help you figure out how you're positioning your book, and it is actually invaluable. There is nothing like getting really, really crystal clear about the book that you're putting out into the world. and You need to be able to write about it and talk about it because you're going to be living in this space for a while and you hopefully are going to have the opportunity to do guest posts and op-eds and the more you can tease out of the uh, out of the book, you know, your understanding of what you're doing, 
the better off you'll be as you need to ride this wave for, for many, many months to come. Okay, so we're going to move into talking about what we're doing next. And I can see that there's a lot of questions already, so I think we'll have a good Q&A section. But part of why we did today um, you know, was to offer all of the stuff on memoir, which Linda Joy and I are totally, totally into on a number of different levels. But we also wanted to share with you guys that we're doing this event. And, you know, clearly, for those of you who don't live nearby, it would require some travel because it's happening in Berkeley. But we want to share with you and invite you to come to Berkeley. Or if you live nearby, great. Um, even more of a reason to come, October 17th and 18th. And there's some really cool stuff, so I do encourage you to look at our website, magicofmemoir2015.com. And these are some of the highlights that I just wanted to share with you before we move into the Q&A. Um, craft and process sessions, two panels. One is about publishing, and I'm going to be sitting on that panel along with the publisher of Steel Press. Obviously, I like to bring in people from the field because I still have those connections. Linda Joy is going to be up on a panel with two other published memoirists. Uh, we're going to have networking opportunities, a cocktail party, and we really have a, a very cool bonus uh, thing in place. The manuscript assessment is a partial manuscript assessment, 25 to 30 pages, but that alone. Hey, Linda. Can you hear me? Now you are back. All right, yeah. I got kicked off the phone, but I am on audio on my, uh, sorry about that. Very, okay. we've been going strong all day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So anyways, I was just making the point about the bonuses so that we would encourage you to check that out. The manuscript assessment in and of itself is a great value and it's gonna be about 25 to 30 pages of assessment. So we we'll hope you'll consider and email us if you're interested um, and we do have the dedicated site so we encourage you to go check that out. I just wanna add a couple things about it. Please do, yeah. Yeah, so I'm really excited because Brooke and I have been teaching together for a while and now we're going to be teaching in person and there's something really special about being face to face with people and some of, some people we know are coming that we've worked with online and virtually and so it's going to be fun to be in person together and in terms of craft and process, uh, a lot of the things that we talked about today as being necessary ingredients, especially the things I talked about in the revision presentation as well as the things you need to know about publishing we're going to be talking about them in depth on that weekend and so I think there's just a huge amount of value to get there and with your laptop and your notebooks and take notes because it'll help you um, get your memoir into better shape already so I just uh, hope to meet all of you yeah. And when we're teaching about memoir, like today, you know, I, I think Linda Joy and I both have the similar orientation, which is that 90% of the people who come to us for memoir coaching for our classes have dreams of traditionally publishing. So we gear almost everything we do to traditionally publish. And we think that you should have a backup plan. And so that is the orientation to the material. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, and I know that Linda shares this opinion mm -hmm. with me, it doesn't matter how you publish because the memoir should be equally good and your absolute best effort. And the sales piece is also the same. <laughs> you know, at the, end, yeah. at the end of the day, if you traditionally publish, if you hybrid publish, if you self publish, you really actually need to know all of these marketing points and you need to have all of this stuff locked down in exactly the same way. And your memoir is going to be equally wonderful. And whether a publisher does your cover or you do your cover, it has to be standout because what I've been talking about in this session, obviously, Obviously is uh, how competitive it is and if you want to do it right then you you just have the absolute best memoir you can write and we're very focused on that with the craft and focused on helping people understand this industry and then encouraging people to publish no matter what and that's one thing that I'm really big on it's part of the reason that I started mm -hmm. she writes press actually to give people an alternate 
way into publishing. So we're passionate about all of that in addition to being passionate about the topic of memoir itself. And I've been published all three ways, uh, self-published, small publisher, traditional publisher, oh, and hybrid. Someone actually has, has a question about what is hybrid, but um, we'll get to that in one second. And uh, what I learned, uh, and I had a very steep learning curve about 15 years ago of what is this whole book writing and publishing thing about, and there's so many things you do need to know, and you can hear about these skills and craft and process in, in, from various people, and we had a great selection today. So thank you, Brooke, for putting all this together. It was, it was, I learned a lot, too. Yeah, we always do when you have a fantastic group of guests like we had today. So it's um, exciting. And yep. so we're going to take the last 15 minutes for Q&A. And oh, I did want to just mention H's for Hawk because mm -hmm. um, we are teaching H's for Hawk in September and there's a free memoir on September 14th, uh, free memoir, <laughs> free webinar. <Yeah. laughs> on September 14th that you can sign up for on our homepage. And we are teaching this best-selling memoir series and we do it, a lot of you already come to it, which is fantastic, but um, you can always just do the free ones or you can do the full classes, but we're super excited to be teaching H's for Hawk. So if you have been hearing about that book or if you have already read it, go sign up. Yeah, I love it, I love that book. Okay, great, so here's some questions. Um, uh, the first one is, when your guests have been speaking of editors, are these editors independent of publishing companies, or are they the person you happen to reach when you make a submission to a publisher? Yeah, so I think we've been talking about both, and that is a confusing word in that sense, because Stephanie is an editor, for instance. She is an acquisitions editor at a, at a major publishing company. Uh, but when you talk about independent or freelance editors, you're talking about people who are being paid by you to copy edit your work or to develop, to developmentally edit your work. So that's one mm -hmm. subgroup of editors. And then the other group of editors are the editors who actually have jobs at traditional publishing houses and they are making acquisitions decisions. Sometimes they're line editing, but you often hear today, you know, that one of the problems with traditional publishing is that editors aren't editing anymore. And that is largely true. I mean, it, you simply just don't have the bandwidth to edit the volume of books that you're acquiring. And so when I was at SEAL, I was often actually editing about half of the books I acquired and outsourcing the rest. Okay, good. Thank you. So it clarifies that a lot. And so um, uh, do, would you define hybrid publishing, uh, Anne is asking, and, and so she guesses it's partly self-publishing. So you, you talked about it before a little bit, but maybe clarify what it yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely, because my press is a hybrid press, and so She Writes Press is a hybrid publishing company, and what that largely means right now is is a publishing company with creative financing. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes it also has a traditional distribution component. And so you're this sort of odd breed between traditional and self because the author is investing in themselves. They're paying for the publishing. They're keeping a higher royalty, a much higher royalty because of that investment. But then the model is somewhat traditional. Uh, in our case, it's wholly traditional. It's it's 100% built, like I said, on Seal Press with traditional distribution. And so models like ours are popping up all over the place as publishing is changing. I've been talking about the high barriers to entry of traditional publishing, and it's just crazy. It's changed. I've been in publishing for 15 years, and the difference between what houses will acquire today versus what they used to acquire 15 years ago is day and night. It really used to be so much about the merit of a book, and today it is about author brand. And so that is just an important thing to understand. And then self-publishing, of course, authors have discovered that it's a very high learning curve. So lots of publishing companies like mine have popped up to help authors navigate that territory, um, but they're not wanting to be traditional publishers because traditional publishers, basically the problem that they have is that Authors are a risk. You know, you are a risk 
because your the likelihood of your book earning out any money is very low. And so it's a model that is sort of problematic and why we're seeing so much shift going on in publishing today. So I hope that covers mm-hmm. it. But there's a lot more. If you guys um, were to be interested in this, I have a Huffington Post column and I have written a lot about <laughs> all of these topics and it's pretty easy to Google. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you got, everybody has to read the last one. Speaking of kick ass, anyway, we'll get them. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great uh, post, Brooke. Um, so uh, somebody wants to know how long, ideally, the bio should be. You said don't make it wimpy, but mm. what would be a good? I mean, I'm sure there's a range, but it's what's in it, not just how long it is. Too. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's an important piece. Is that it's about it's more about what's in it. When I said wimpiness, you know, that people often just forget to showcase their own awesomeness. So, um, you know, two pages max, but you can have a really strong bio in one page as long as it's saying the right things. And if you have a website and social media, you want to put that in there. Uh, so one to two pages. Okay, good. So, um, what about the, excuse me, I have to change phones. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. We're all running out of our, our things are starting to beep because we've been on the phone for so long. Okay, here's another question about chapter summaries. Uh, is it more important, this is from Jennifer, is it more important to include the voice and writing style or get to the point, get the point across? Uh, she's made a big effort to include her style and voice, but in doing that, the summaries are longer and she's worried about losing the thread hmm. a little bit in there. So, yeah, it, it's a good question. I mean, I I understand that and it's supposed to be a summary. Mm-hmm. So, you you want to have style, but if it is the case that you really don't know how to pare down and that you're so focused on the style, you might need to rethink it a little bit and just let it let go of that piece. I I think you should sacrifice style for plot. And the plot is the part you're talking about, the threads, because Mm -hmm. really the editor wants to know what happened. And, and then if you you also want to focus on the takeaway, right? So sort of what is the purpose of this chapter? And as I said, I think that therefore you might need to sacrifice style a little bit um, for the sake of, you know, just not having these really long, I just have seen these authors, you know, who it was like, they have 25 chapters and each chapter summary is a page and a half. And so you end up with a 50 mm. page chapter summaries and no, no editor is going to slog their way through that. They're just not. So again, cliff notes. Well, the other thing is that if you're doing it in a proposal, they're going to get a chapter, real chapters, at least a few chapters, they'll be able to see the style there. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so this is connected to hybrid publishing again. If you're doing hybrid publishing, do you still need the proposal? No, you don't. So we have a submissions process, and that submissions process is um, that we we ju- judge, you know, assess the work on 30 pages and a query letter. So that and every hybrid publisher is different. So if you don't want to do it, but that said, I'll go back to my point made here tonight, which is that I still think you should do it. I think putting together a marketing plan, thinking through who your target audience is, really summarizing your own work and doing that. Because when you publish, like if you publish with us, with She Writes Press, we actually need all of that stuff, not for you to be onboarded, but for the distributor. We need a synopsis. We need an author bio. So at some point, you're going to have to do the work anyway. (laughs) <laughs> so get ready right now. Okay. So uh, how about uh, Marina wants to know about suggestions for people still in the midst of writing. Can we worry about selling and pitching later? Or or the point is we need to be thinking about all this from the get-go, even if we do not have sample 
chapters we actually like since we're supposed to be getting the vomit draft down and not get, <laughs> getting stuck. I you know it's like that's a great to do everything. I, I love how it just like it, it expresses all of the anxiety right there. Yeah. The question. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. totally don't worry about this. I mean, I, I think that you don't have to think about the proposal until I think it's worth turning to the proposal when your memoir is done. So both Gordon and Stephanie spoke to the fact that you can sell your proposal based on uh, propo uh, excuse me, sell your memoir based on a proposal. That's totally true. However, Linda Joy spoke to this and I've, we've both seen it. The people who shop their memoirs and the memoir is not done and then they get completely suckered into shopping land and then they give up their writing practice. So it doesn't really make sense. I think finishing the memoir, feeling like you have a great draft, simultaneously working on your platform. So all the stuff Dan talked about is stuff that you can do and focus on while you're writing. Uh, you know, at the bare minimum, get up a good website, start a Facebook page, you know, all that good stuff. And then the proposal piece, in my opinion, should come later. There's always going to be people who want to shop their memoirs before they're complete. The, you know, and some of you might be that person and it's okay, but it stems from a couple things. One is impatience and the other is a need for validation. So just consider those two facts. I mean, there might be other reasons as well, but really the whole drive of memoir needs to be a bit internal. Impatience is not going to get you anywhere. And so I'm a firm believer in finishing the memoir and then starting the proposal. And the, I'd like to add to that. Uh, as you're working on your memoir, the amazing thing that happens is that your story changes as you actually write it. You change, your writing style changes. You might even change the way you want to present your themes. I mean, it's still a hugely creative process. So you, you need to know what it is before you can actually present it. So give yourself room to be creative and, and let it happen. Yeah. Okay, somebody has a point about the query letter. Do you send it with the proposal or before? This is from Anne. Before. So you send the query letter asking permission to send the proposal. So at the end of the query letter, it literally would say, I have a complete nonfiction or memoir proposal. May I send it to you? And what it does is it forces a response from them. If you don't hear back from them, you can follow up by forwarding your query letter. But I am not a believer in sending your proposal without a yes, I'm interested because it can literally, you might never hear back. And then your proposal is with someone. I feel that you want to have made connection with someone who says actively, ooh, yes, your query letter sounds interesting to me, and yes, I will agree to look at it, because then you have a reason to follow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so some people want to know about our Magic of Memoir Weekend. Uh, one question is, how many attendees do we expect? And another one is when, important uh, one, uh, when does the early bird end? So the early bird ends September 8th. Right, I believe. Um, yes, so we, we wanted to extend it a little while. And, you know, clearly based on today and based on the conference, we're trying to make things as affordable as possible and give people good value. So that is extended for a while. And it involves travel and for some people and hotels. So we're clearly interested in giving you guys some time to think about this and feel free to email. Uh, we'll have a call with you if you have questions. In terms of attendance, we're aiming for 50. So, you know, I, I think, you know, we will reach that. Um, so it's an intimate group, certainly, you know, it's not going to be like a, a hall with, you know, 2000 lecture seats. It is an, a fantastic open high ceiling ballroom kind of room with windows in downtown Berkeley. I love it. It's a great, great room, but it's an intimate room, you know, that doesn't seat too many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So thank you. Yes. It's going to be so much fun to be there too. Um, so um, 
somebody said they might be coming from Connecticut. Is there a hotel deal? Lori is asking. Yes, I think there is. Would you want to? Yeah, it's on the website. So just look at travel details and um, we have a room block with, a, I think, a pretty good hotel rate considering downtown Berkeley and the location. So that yeah, the answer is yes. And if you're traveling from far and you need a three nights instead of two nights, you can get the discount for three nights. We, I already looked into it. So on the website, you can only get two nights, but if you call, they'll extend three. And so just a couple things in case of travel. Uh, oh, the Oakland airport is closer to us, but you may get even a better deal coming from San Francisco than you would need to get over to the East Bay. We are across the bay from San Francisco. Uh, just so people know, San Francisco Airport is about an hour away, but you can easily get to us. And the Oakland Airport is about 20 minutes away, uh, just for information. Yeah. Okay, let me see. There's another couple of questions. Those are very helpful. Um, do you, why do you think the barriers to traditional publishing are higher than they've ever been? Anne is asking this question. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I mean, it's about the the shift in the industry and all the things that are happening. I mean, the consolidation of publishers is one big one. You know, bigger publishers eating up little publishers. Um, I think it also has to do with traditional publishing. The, the model, as I have written about and talked about quite a bit, is broken. So the idea that you pay an author an advance and then that that advance needs to be earned out before the author and the publisher makes any money used to make a lot of sense when there was not very much quantity. But the problem today is that there are tons and tons and tons of great writers and people aspire to be published in a way that they didn't, you know, in like, let's just say the 40s and 50s or even the 60s and 70s. You know, there's the memoir revolution. There are, you know, just a lot of passion around hobby writing. And so the problem is simply... Um, too much inventory or too many books and the and then there's a smaller share of market portion and so and there's just also a lot of um you know stuff happening in in book publishing too like borders going out of business for instance and bookstores selling all or closing all over the country so publishing is in disarray and and i think that that's a large reason is that what it's really made publishing, you know, the traditional publishers contract because they don't want to take risks. And um, it's just, it's really shifted the game a lot and it's made it incredibly difficult to get published so that publishers only really want to take a risk on you. If you're quote unquote, a sure bet. <laughs> the problem mm. I had when I had Stephanie's job is I was like, well, what the hell is a sure bet? You know, like, what does that mm -hmm. actually look like? And and I think it's a problem that um, acquisitions editors have to confront. So it's it's just tough out there. Is there such a thing as a sure bet? There isn't. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, very frustrating. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, somebody was talking about, you know, they had a grief, uh, I think it was this Jennifer, uh, a grief memoir and wanted to compare it with uh, your magical thinking, but then of course Joan Didion is a celebrity, and I think you addressed that pretty um, well. And you and somebody else talked about that too. Well, I think it's okay to say that your writing is like Joan Didion's, but it's but then you wouldn't use it as a comp title. Like your magical thinking. I mean, frankly, I don't think that's a horrible comp title. It's not as bad as Wild or Eat, Pray, Love, because as much as that was a successful book, it was not an off the charts. You know, I mean, Joan Didion is famous, yes. But in your query letter, you can write that you have a style that is similar to Joan Didion, you know, which is not the same as saying you think your book is going to be the next year of magical thinking. So there are ways to do it. But in your comp titles, you know, it's okay to have one comp title that is a famous book, you know, but I wouldn't say like your magical thinking and wild and, you know, like mm -hmm. every famous book you've ever looked at, you want to mm -hmm. like, and this is the thing, the research of the comp titles is, is somewhat difficult because you have to find those mid list books. And so mm -hmm. one way to do it is to go into your local bookstore and to talk to your, um, to booksellers 
even Barnes and Noble, I mean, they're less helpful, but they can help. And then the other thing is looking on Amazon, you know, Stephanie said this in her presentation, the, um, you know, readers who bought this book also liked this other book. You can Mm -hmm. use that function to research memoirs and it's more effective than you might think. So the comp titles, you know, and take your time with it. That's the other thing. And, and think about it and maybe share with your book group or, you know, Dan's Facebook group or our uh, Linda Joy's National Association of Memoir Writers on Facebook. If you go into those, um, those Facebook groups and you say, Hey, I'm writing a book on this topic. Has anyone read any other books? You're going to connect yourselves with a lot of, people who know who who are who are avid readers right on the note of avid readers i think we're done for the day (laughs) oh man some of you have been here all day and we're tired and it's been fantastic and uh really can't thank you enough for signing up for being with us and linda joy it's always my absolute pleasure to Mm -hmm. um present with you yeah, it was wonderful, uh, Brooke. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, we hope to see you all again on future events and wish you the very, very best in writing and de- and developing, revising, and publishing your memoirs. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye, everybody. Good night.